Ladies and gentlemen, dear speakers, my name is Achim Hochdorfer. I'm the director of the Museum Brandhorst. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all tonight to the first of three evenings of the symposium Future Bodies from a Recent Past, Sculpture, Technology and the Body since the 1950s. We are most grateful for all our contributors for having agreed to join us under these very special circumstances. The symposium is a starting point for a large research project on sculpture since the post-war period. It will lead to a major survey exhibition at the Museum Brandhorst in the summer of 2022. It is the second project of its kind at the Museum Brandhorst after painting 2.0 expression in the information age in 2015. Both scholarly exhibitions that investigate the development of a specific artistic medium. What might seem at odd with the post-medium condition is in fact born from an observation of the continued specific life of these media in the second half of the 20th century and of the constant renewal since their purported death in the case of painting or dissolution in the case of sculpture. Future Bodies from a Recent Past looks specifically at the intersection of technological developments and changing notions of the body as reflected within the medium of sculpture, a medium that seems as vivid as ever when we look at the resurgence of sculptural works within the so-called post-digital art practices of the last decade. But I will leave it to my colleague Patricia Dunder to introduce the project in more detail. Before I hand over to her, please allow me to express my thanks to all those involved in, realize, in realizing this ambitious project. My thanks go to all the con contributors of the symposium. It is an extraordinary group of scholars from different disciplines. I would like to thank Manuela Ammer, Marie-Louise Angerer, Joe Applin, Josef Barla, Louis Jude Socke, Marta Civanska, Anne Catherine Hales, Alex Kitnick, Antje krause Wahl, Namiko Kunimoto, Megan Luke, Maria Muhle, Ursula Ströbele, Janine Tang and Anne Wagner for their participation. It is an incredible honor to have you with us and we're eagerly awaiting your contribution and the following discussions. I would also like to thank our communication department, specifically Anna Woll, head of the department, Caroline Ruppert, intern, and Marina Ebenherr, freelance assistant. It seems very apt for this project to take place online with body before screens. And at the same time, we all know technology doesn't always make things easier. Our colleagues from the events department, Nina Jelic and Andrea Schick, have prepared the technical realization of the symposium with all due care and attention to detail. We are most grateful for their fantastic support and also to ShowTech, our partner in crime when it comes to digital solutions. None of this would have been possible without the generous support of the ERES Foundation for Arts and Science, our fantastic partner in this research and exhibition project. I would like to thank Sabine Adler for her trust and support. My heartfelt thanks also goes to PIN, Freunde der Pinakothek der Moderne, the friends of our museum, and their chairs, Dorothy Wahl and Katharina von Perfall, who with enormous de dedication enable our programs at Museum Brandhorst. We are delighted that we could realize the symposium in collaboration with the Study Center for Modern and Contemporary Art at the Zentralinstitut für Kunstgeschichte in Munich under the helm of Ursula Ströbele.
Not only will Ursula herself contribute to our symposium, but she managed to complement it with a program of online lectures on art and artificial intelligence hosted at the Central Institute. We are grateful for this ongoing and fruitful exchange and collaboration. Last but not least, I would like to extend my warmest thanks to my colleagues Patricia Dunder, chief curator and initiator of this project, and Franziska Linhardt, research associate at the Museum Brandhorst. Patricia and Franziska conceived this symposium over the course of the last month. Together with their intern, Lena Tilk, they offer us an incredibly rich program, which I hope you will all enjoy. The symposium is only the very starting point for future bodies from a recent past. We hope that we will be able to welcome you all in person here at the Museum Bramthorst at the very latest for the opening of the exhibition in May next year, May 2022. Thank you very much. Now I would like to hand over to Patricia Dunder and I wish we could give her a big round of applause. Thank you, Achim. Thanks a lot for the warm welcome. And I can only join you in thanking the entire team that has helped us realize the symposium. We have Nina Jelic and Andrea Schick, Anna Woll, Marina Ebenherr, Lena Tilk, as well as Tobi Klose, Florian Wolf, and Volker Wiedemann, who are all working behind the scenes right now. So technology is not easy and needs a lot of people working with us on it. And I'm very grateful for everyone to help. And of course, I'm also hugely grateful to Franziska Lienhardt, with whom I co-organized the symposium and whom you'll all have the chance to meet on screen in the next days. Ladies and gentlemen, dear speakers, I'm thrilled to finally welcome you all to the symposium Future Bodies from a Recent Past, Sculpture, Technology and the Body Since the 1950s. It's really a great honor to be joined by so many fantastic colleagues. And I have to say that the exchange with all of you carried us through the last months. We're delighted that we can finally share a portion of these conversations with our audience over the next days. As said, the symposium is the public debut of a large research project that Franziska and I are working on and that will lead to a major sculpture exhibition at the Museum Brandhorst in early summer 2022. The initial idea for future bodies from a recent past dates back to a few years ago. It started with the observation that many contemporary artistic practices from the early 2010s mostly those framed under the overly homogenizing term post-digital art, seem to lack proper art historical contextualization. These artworks were being discussed along their shared interest in digital reproduction media and their effects on bodies, often with the aid of recent new materialist theories in science and philosophy. But little attention seemed to be paid to their formal and content-related predecessors within the visual arts. This was surprising as both the persisting sculptural forms of many of the artworks, but also post-digital art's more general relationship to technology and changing notions of the body can in fact be linked back to developments in art and in sculpture in particular since the beginning of the 20th century. In this context, it is helpful to remember, and here I quote Anne M. Wagner's A House Divided American Art Since 1955, that sculpture's properties have always been influenced, if not defined, by developments external to the visual arts. I quote, Sculpture is in constant dialogue with other forms of manufacture, forms that extend to the whole history of human making. Even the most basic techniques of three-dimensional facsimiles, fired or unfired clay, cut stone, cast and chased metal, were not developed only to make sculpture. They are the central techniques of human civilization, of the production of a distinctively human world. All worthwhile sculpture resonates with other sculpture, yes, but even more with such milestones as the brick, the wall, the barrel, the bowl, the column, the coffin, the hand axe, the howitzer, the missile, the microchip. End of quote. In a nutshell, throughout the ages, technological advancement and changing production techniques have always already impacted sculpture's guises with its genuine openness to external development and the absence of an intrinsic materiality of sculpture, it seems the ideal medium to reflect what any such changes entail both for understanding of art and artistic practices, 
and for understanding our embodied relationship with a radically altered world. And here we are at the core of what prompted us to develop this project. We found ourselves confronted with the empirical observation of a renewed interest in sculptural forms from the side of the artist, in view of massive changes in technology that affect notions of time, of the body and corporality, and of course of materiality, all aspects that are genuinely connected to sculpture as a medium. So it struck us as crucial to look back at sculpture with its specific history of making and its historical and intellectual formation in order to fully grasp what is at play in contemporary artistic production. The aim of Future Bodies from a recent past is to discuss the relationship between sculpture and the body against the background of this changing utopian and dystopian potential of technological development. And by this we mean both current developments and such already bygone or already overcome. What is immediately evident for contemporary art and especially the rematerialized avatars and technobodies that seem ubiquitous today can be traced back as a little noticed history of sculpture that we will try to expand upon in the next days. How would sculpture be thought of and defined in relation to specific technological developments, but also in relation to the social, political and scientific changes that enable these? How does sculpture relate to changing concepts of bodies and corporality? Is the technological inherent in the sculptural body and to what extent do innovations in materials and production techniques shape this relationship? And what are the consequences for a theory of contemporary sculpture? These are some of the questions that we will discuss with leading theorists from various disciplines in the next day. And on behalf of Francisca Lienhardt and myself, I most cordially like to thank all contributors for joining us in this endeavor. As you might have noticed from the title and the announcement um, of our symposium, the historical starting point for future bodies from a recent past is the 1950s. Not only do the 50s mark the long post-war decade with its traces of technology-induced destruction, we also got interested in this decade as a starting point, for it marks the era of the transition from the so-called mechanical to the information paradigm which gained broad visibility in social context around that moment and which continues to determine the present with its fundamental restructuring of the body, technology and society. And this, of course, brings me directly to our first panel titled Transformations in Post-War Sculpture. The post-war period sees an impressive popularization of technologies, cybernetics, media and communication technologies that instill hopes for fundamental changes in society and at the same time, they're rooted in the developments and destruction advanced by the military industrial apparatus of World War II. The 50s are also the decade of reconstruction and reconfiguration of nations in this new world order. The panel that we'll hear tonight focuses on three artists, David Smith from the US, Eduardo Paolozzi from the UK and Tanaka Atsuko from Japan. Although the artists worked in very different cultural contexts, their countries are all connected by the calamity of the Second World War and affected by its aftermath, albeit in very different ways. We have the trauma of destruction and the wish to overcome it on the one hand and the fear of a lingering nuclear threat on the other. I believe that looking at these artists' practices opens a view on sculpture as a formal language and subject matter that is deeply entrenched in the changes of its time. First, we're going to hear about the US American sculptor David Smith, who in the 1950s was celebrated for his welded steel sculptures as the most important representative of American art by Clement Greenberg. Using elements such as gears, farm equipment, or bolts for his sculptures, his works communicated through the language of an era which was about to vanish, the era of manual labor. Annen Wagner will introduce us to his practice. Second, we're looking at Eduardo Paolozzi, the British artist and founding member of the Independent Group, a London-based interdisciplinary think tank. Paolozzi's use of bits and pieces of rubbish that he found in the streets of London made him an outright archaeologist of post-war destruction. I'm thankful for Alex Kitnick, who will present the work of the late 50s, early 60s. And the third protagonist that we'll hear about tonight is Japanese artist Tanaka Atsuko, and specifically her electric dress, the performance piece that reacted to the rapid industrial transformation of the country. Japan embraced the technological advancement in the post-war period, mo maybe most wholeheartedly of all countries, not least as a means to declare a new Japan, 
an optimistic, future-oriented country that broke with its role in the Second World War. Namiko Kunimoto will introduce us to her work. The three speakers will give their presentations consecutively and will convene again after Namiko's presentation for our discussion. So it's my pleasure to now welcome Anne Wagner um, with her presentation, David Smith's Sculpture as Sign. Please allow me to briefly introduce Anne to our audience. Anne is an outstanding art critic, his art historian and teacher who has dedicated a lot of her scholarly research to investigating the properties and the qualities of sculpture. She's the class of 1936 chair emerita at the University of California, Berkeley, now based in London and Norfolk from where she joins us today. She was visiting professor at the Courtauld Institute of Art from 2013 to 14, other positions held since her move to the United Kingdom include the post of Henry Moore Foundation Research Curator at Tate Britain, 2010 and 11, visiting distinguished professor at the University of York, 2010 through 13, and Mellow Residential Fellow in Arts and Practice and Scholarship at the Richard and Mariel Gray Center for the Arts and Inquiry at the University of Chicago in 2012. Her books include Three Artists, Three Women from 1996, Mother Stone, The Vitality of Modern British Sculpture, 2005, and A House Divided American Art Since 1955 from 2012. Anne is certainly one of the most formidable connoisseurs of David Smith's oeuvre, and I'm more than thrilled that she accepted our invitation. She used the opportunity to take a close look at Smith's intellectual horizon in the 1950s by research on his library. I will briefly quote from her abstract. How is sculpture, that eminently physical enterprise, like language? Does this mean it is also like writing? Like language, like writing, can it stop making sense? Phrased in these terms, it is clear that such questions were not specific to Smith. On the contrary, they were shared with other thinkers, the anthropologists and structuralists, semioticians and philosophers of his day. Armed with the inventory of Smith's library and aware of his connections with and interest in contemporary intellectuals, this paper aims to look again at Smith's sculpture with such questions in mind. Dear Anne, we're very much looking forward to your presentation, David Smith's Sculpture as Sign. And just as an information to our audience, Anne is joining us with audio, so you will see a still image and her presentation. She can hear us perfectly well and will be available for questions afterwards. And the screen is yours. Thanks. Thank you so much. It's um, great to be here. And I wish only that I could um, be there a little more actively. We begin with a photograph of David Smith, a photo which serves to introduce him as what we can confidently, if rather stuffily, call an embodied self. Perhaps the phrase underscores that sculpture is nothing if not a bodily art. One theme of this paper concerns the sort of bodiliness that in the case of Smith's sculpture is in play. Yet it seems right to look first at Smith the man because both his work and the skills he used to produce it grew directly from his personal qualities and experience. His experience in the developments and destruction realized by the military and industrial buildup of World War II above all. Next slide, please. As we know, the impact of that war and its many repercussions have helped to generate the topic of this conference, particularly as it brings into focus, I quote, the developments and destruction advanced by the military industrial apparatus of World War II and before. Smith and his work fit into this context perfectly. Both development and destruction shaped the artist's life and career. Next slide, please. This is why I start here in the early 1940s with David Smith in his role as a war worker, a welder on a munitions assembly line. He's the man who's standing in the photograph, his visor lifted to accommodate the unknown photographer, then touring the factory, seeking evocative shots. 
War work, what it looked like, who did it, was common fodder in the illustrated magazines at that moment. But this photo also brings home Smith's grasp of a skill invaluable to the just mentioned apparatus. This is why the workers employed in Schenectady's factories, Smith included, were exempt from the military. Their lives and labor were more valuable back at home than on the battlefield. Next slide, please. All that was needed was to transfer the skills initially acquired manufacturing cars in peacetime to tanks and planes in World War II. War or peace, the necessary skills were the same. And as for the factories, they were quickly rejigged. Look at a classic example of the assembly line in a Ford factory in Willow Run. Next slide, please. The second shows the same factory, if not the same shop floor, now producing bombers, the US having fully mobilized for World War II. These are the sort of conditions which meant that after demobilization in 1945, Smith had massively enlarged his command of the very tools and skills he would rely on to sculpt. Yet even before the war, Smith was already committed to welded sculpture. Not that welding had much to do with sculpture at the time. Better to think of it as a bit like collage, except in three dimensions. Next slide, please. The idea makes sense in Picasso's case, who in 1929, with help from his fellow Spaniard, Julio Gonzalez, an expert in the welding of iron, constructed the tour de force that is Picasso's head of a woman, using, among other materials, tight cold coiled springs for hair and two jointed colanders to conjure a head. Then, perhaps Picasso or perhaps Gonzalez painted the whole. Next slide, please. By this time, Smith, aged 23, was not only looking at the work coming out of Europe, but also doing his best to keep up with it. Within just a few years later, he produced Agricola Head, a Latin title we could translate as Agricultural Head or Agrarian Head. In contrast to Picasso's piece, Smith's bust looks male, not least thanks to its painted clay surface and sketchy features. To my eye, they seem to conjure drain pipes and flower pots, plus the ruddy complexion that speaks of outdoor work. Next slide, please. Smith himself, however, was an indoor worker, a machine age artist, as his workshop set up amply informs us. There he ruled, exercising full command of the cutters, stamps, presses with which his own workshop overflowed. Next slide, please. There, in Bolton Landing, his view of his art, his vision of it, came into its own. This is the vision that I've du dubbed sculpture as sign, which leads, of course, to the necessity of bearing down on the question of how Smith saw his work, not least as an act of signification. The question at first seems difficult to answer, but in the end, there's plenty to stay. For a start, there's little doubt that he was quite conscious of the need to form a view of his work. Simply consider how he set out the sculpture in the fields around his studio. It's as if each work is a point of reference, a coordinate on an unseen grid a grid made up of permanent concrete bases on which each was fixed. Next slide, please. The scheme made it possible 
to keep to the same parameters, the same arrangement, winter and summer, year after year. Clearly, this is useful when you are pondering the three-dimensional presence sculpture commands. Given his solitary working conditions, such careful stock-taking wasn't all that easy to do. Yet we can be sure he gave it some thought and then turned to the grid. Why? Remember that every grid is a relational system which in its ideal form exists in two dimensions. In other words, grids are placeless and flat. To really take hold of Smith's sculpture, it's crucial to keep both ideas, flatness and placelessness, in mind. He seems to have done so, not only in arranging his sculpture, but in producing it. Flatness was a function of his process, part of how he worked. And for the most part, he worked alone. Hence his reply to an interviewer in 1961, I can't use studio assistance any more than Mondrian could have used assistance. It is defensive in a certain way because it's contradictory to the progression of this age. Next slide, please. So on the one hand, there's the virile drama conveyed in Dan Budnick's great photo of his effort to position Bolton Voltry 10 and then on the other, the considerably more prosaic, yet also defensive, studio practice. Defensive because anti-modern. Defensive because he worked alone. This is why he welded his sculptures only after arranging and rearranging their pieces on the studio floor. Perhaps the outcome was inevitable. Much of his sculpture, certainly the large-scale work, seems as concerned with surface as it is with volume, which is to say it is as interested in planarity as it is in depth. The flatness of Smith's sculpture has its inevitable limits, yet those limits are clearly the precise conditions that the artist aimed to discover, to map. Next slide, please. This is what's happening on the occasions when the steel components of a possible composition were laid out on paper or canvas rather than directly on the floor. Then, using a wily stencil technique, as one critic called it, Smith took up a spray gun, in the process creating absences, dematerialized sculptures, which bring to mind the great phrase first mockingly used against the English painter Turner, images of nothing and very like. For Smith, however, making a sculpture was very much something, something heavy, and often hard to do. Thus, his tactic of working with steel components arranged on the floor. There, each could be towed rather than lifted into various positions until the composition looked right. Only then were the pieces lifted and bottom to top securely welded into place. Next slide, please. Last came one final set of decisions, the one that gave the sculpture its presence, its look. Some smiths were carefully painted. Others presented brilliantly polished, yet in the raw. Smith had clearly articulated views about both. To cite him directly, the metal itself possesses little art history. What associations it possesses are those of this century, power, structure, movement, progress, suspension, 
brutality. What a list. Yet we also need to take account of Smith's laconic comment about his quasi-calligraphic treatment of surfaces. I depend a great deal on the reflective power of light. Once again, he is speaking to the essence of his work. To look at his surfaces in the sunlight is to see the traces of the sander, sometimes held stably, sometimes skipping wildly, making a radiant scribble. These surface marks have a Kilroy bravado, an illegible mark of self and presence, a sign volatilized by the rays of the sun. It plays across the surfaces of his great series, the QB, and sizzled even more splendidly on the enormous steel construction that is Becca, here sited on the rooftop of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Next slide, please. At this point in a paper that given its brevity is inevitably also something of a wily stencil, it's time to clarify my aims. Aims that try to assess the implication of Smith's way of working for the forms he found for his work. Made on the flat, Smith sculptures savor surface and surface nests, not simply as showy effects, but also as the crucial condition of every work's physical existence. Something like a primal memory, indelible, not to be sanded or polished away. At the same time, the scribble and skip of the sander brings Smith's work as close as it comes to weightlessness, to calligraphy, or should I say, transcendence. It is never truly virtualized, truly vaporized, but still, at serendipitous moments, it crackles with light. At such moments, the sculpture's body is banished, replaced by a scribble, a cipher, a flash. Meanwhile, back in the studio, another sculpture begins with metal place, plates once again lying flat, awaiting the touch of a foot. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, thanks a lot for this. Um, I think we will have the possibility to look at the cue by um, that you brought to us and talk in relation to them in the discussion. Um, so I would hand over for the moment um, and introduce Alex Kitnick now as our next speaker. Um, Alex is Assistant Professor of Art History and Visual Culture at Bard College in Annandale on Hudson, New York. Alex received his PhD from the Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton University in 2010 and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles from 2011 to 2012. Alex is a frequent contributor to publications including Art Forum, May, October and Texte zur Kunst. In fact, he edited the October edition 136 on New Brutalism and a collection on John McHale's writing the Expandable Reader Articles on Art, Architecture, Design, and Media, 1951 through 1979, both in 2011. His book, Distant Early Warning, Marshall McLuhan and the Transformation of the Avant-Garde, will be published by University of Chicago Press this year. In his presentation, Alex Kitnick will speak about Eduardo Paolozzi, an artist that is particularly close to Munich for his years of teaching at the Art Academy throughout the 1980s. Alex's engagement with Paolozzi's work dates back to his dissertation titled Eduardo Paolozzi and Others, 1947 through 1955. And today's presentation is, if you will, a chronological follow-up to the period discussed in his PhD. Alex will look at Paolozzi's sculpture works between 1958 and the early 1960s, reflecting on the condition of sculpture in this pivotal period. 
He approaches the question of the properties of sculpture through the various revisitations of Gotthold Ephraim Lessing's Laokoan treatise from 1766. I quote from his abstract. In a series of collages and drawings published in 1963, Paolozzi pictured the Laokoan, the antique cult sculpture in this case, through a car window. The image is paradigmatic. On the one hand, it is the picture of an accident with wreckage in the offing, and thus it evokes the ruined bodies of Paolozzi's bronze figures. On the other hand, it is an image of a crash with all the Ballardian resonance that the word carries, an image of the body and technology interfacing in new, powerful ways. This is precisely the crossroads that sculpture has faced at mid-century, what we might call the newest Laokon. Sculpture not as a set of abstract qualities, but rather as a violent assemblage of bodies, histories, and materials. Dear Alex, um, welcome, and I hand over to you for your paper, New New Newest, Eduardo Paolozzi's La Ocon. Thank you so much. Uh, I would say that it, it's wonderful to be here, but even such a simple statement seems complicated. Um, but I, I really want to thank you, Patrizia and Francisca, as well, for your amazing um, organizational capabilities and also your enthusiasm. It's really been a lot of fun to work on this. So I want to begin this talk uh, by taking a look at some collages and drawings, really some images, images might be the proper word, that Eduardo Palazzi included in his 1963 artist book, The Metalization of a Dream. This is the cover of the book. Um, there's also a version in the artist's 1962 film, History of Nothing, um, and it's on YouTube for anyone who's interested to see it. Um, but the book's title, pointing in a Freudian direction toward the unconscious, but also retrofitting it for an industrial re regime seems particularly notable. Something similar is going on in these images too, especially if we think of the dream as a kind of processing of images of the past. Palazzi's images show the Laokuan sculpture through a car windshield. The picture of the car Uh, seems to have been imported from some gadgetry manual showing off all the new features of the model. Everything is itemized, numbered, and pointed to. Gas, brake, radio, etc. The Laokuan, on the other hand, is entirely itself, a timeless emblem of sculpture, somehow both classical and Renaissance and neoclassical at once a touchstone always turned back to. It crafted at the start of the common era, it was unearthed in a Roman vineyard at um, the start of 1506. Again, uh, there are two versions you can see on either page, and I think it's interesting that um, Palazzi kind of returns to it again and again in between these clunkily typed notes, um, uniting them, which are suggestive, if not explanatory, vaguely mysterious, vaguely mysterious and often misspelled. The main tenets point to modern technology, airplane, motor car, flying man, etc. But the Laokuan is modern in other ways. Ever since Lessing used it to name his treatise on the effects and qualities of the different arts in 1776, it has been an emblem for the modern, the distinction and disciplining of the arts, literature, music, painting, sculpture, each to their own. Lessing was interested in the limits of each art, what each one could do, what they were capable of. And this was the idea that Clement Greenberg picked up on roughly 200 years later in his 1940 essay toward a newer Laokoan, which sought to make Lessing right for the times. Greenberg had the same general idea as Lessing, 
that each art could only do one thing and that it had to make that fact clear and, and plain, that it had to show what it was made of, no confusion of the arts in other words. But his essay was also what he called an historical justification for abstract art. Art wouldn't be trying to double the effects of literature anymore. It would be its own thing. And while Greenberg spoke mostly about painting, the other arts had to find their essential elements too. The arts then have been hunted back to their mediums, he wrote. So in sculpture, the stone figure appears to be on the point of relapsing into the original monolith, and the cast seems to narrow and smooth itself back to the original molten stream from which it was poured, or tries to remember the texture and plasticity of the clay in which it was first worked out. Back to basics, back to first things. And Greenberg seems to be asking us to imagine, I think, the purifying, time-smoothed forms of Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth. And I'm showing you here um, Hepworth's three forms, carving in gray alabaster um, from 1935. And it's in its tripartite form, I think, it actually kind of evokes the Lao Kuan um, group. Um, so I think this is where Greenberg is pointing us, but we might also consider a work such as this 1943 etching by the British Abex adjacent painter and printmaker William Stanley Hayter, titled Lao Kuan, which we might imagine um, was trying to kind of facilitate Greenberg's point by whirling the sculptural group around until it reached a state of abstraction. But back to the original sculpture for a moment. The Lao Kuan is a near life-size sculpture that feels larger than life. A father and two sons are trying to fend off some tremendous serpent that's been sent to wrangle them, strangle them, bite them, the serpent sinking its fangs deep into the priest's left hip. Everyone is naked, though a bit of cloth drips off one son's shoulders and gathers on a pile between the father's legs. These immaculate bodies are fully flexed in panic. For Winkelmann, this sculptural grouping was the epitome of beauty. This cauldron of pain, limbs flailing yet somehow everything still in order, masculinity, masculinity made heroic, terror and death somehow made uplifting. And yet it's always struck me as a very strange emblem for arguing against the confusion of the arts as Lessing and Greenberg did. Because when you look at this sculptural group, it really is an emblem of confusion, limbs and generations, man and animal, fathers and sons, all knotted together in this fantastic brawl of a sculpture. Things are confused here. You just have to look at it. The Lao Kuan sits today at the entrance of the Vatican galleries in the octagonal court, strangely outside, but it, it has long been set free, released and circulated through reproduction, casting, etching, printing, photography, and postcards. Already in the early 19th century, William Blake took a shot at it, annotating his own impression with conspiratorial graffiti, challenging its source and inspiration. For him, this was no Greek priest, but Jah and his two sons, Satan and Adam, as they were copied from the cherubim of Solomon's temple. And he makes other mysterious musings about art, man, and Christianity too. So Palazzi is part of a history of alteration, challenges, and defacement. But in Palazzi's images, of course, the Lao Kuan is seen through a windshield. It is truncated, edited, missing, for example, the father's extended right hand clutching the serpent, um, which it must be noted was itself a later addition, the result of an overeager conservator, um, and it has now once again been removed. It is, myth, it is missing most of both sons, 
and the priest's body below the midsection. It's a slice, in other words. If the viewer, me, is in the driver's seat, we don't see it coming, or we only see it when it's already too late. In his text for the medalization book that I started with, um, Lawrence Alloway wrote, Paolozzi's content is not the strangeness of the contrast of the sculpture with alien surroundings, but its acclamation to the changing context, so the way these two things kind of gravitate toward one another. Things are melding together, in other words, and we might remember that Paolozzi's independent group colleague, Richard Hamilton, was styling this new overlap as well. Here is his um, 1958 painting, Hers is a Lush Situation. And I think it's worth noting that where in Hamilton's vision, this um, conjunction of body and machine um, leads to almost a kind of evaporation. Um, in, in Palazzi's sculptural language, as we'll see, we see almost a kind of incrustation. Um, but I want us to think, too, about the technology of the windshield in particular. In many ways, of course, it's an emblem for how we see a frame, a gauge. In a spread from Marshall McLuhan's 1967 book, The Medium is the Massage, an Inventory of Effects, there's an important spread of a windshield. The moral is about how and in which way we look. The image is a photo montage, and the primary image, the kind of outside one, um, seems to have been taken in a tunnel. We see the gleam and sheen of cars passing by. But it turns out the picture is less about the windshield than it is the rear view mirror, that strange device we have for looking backwards when going forwards. And in there, Quentin Fiore, the graphic designer who pieced this book together from for McLuhan has pasted an image of an old covered wagon being led by a few whiffed horses. At the bottom, McLuhan writes, the past went that away. When faced with a totally new situation, we tend always to attach ourselves to the objects, to the flavor of the most recent past. We look at the present through a rear view mirror. We march backwards into the future. Suburbia lives imaginatively in bonanza land, end quote. This is a too common habit, running into the future still cathected and connected to all the habits and ways and images of the past. And that's why it's important that Paolozzi is doing the opposite. He's driving full speed into the past, smashing into it. He's a kind of revisionist, one might say. The future for him changes how we see the past too. And yet I want to mark a division between him and kind of earlier avant-garde. Um, Paolozzi is not a futurist ranting about the decaying uh, museums and praising airplanes and motor cars. Paolozzi's present, by contrast, is a strange combination of future and past. So if Greenberg's newer Laoquan edged back towards sculpture's materiality, what I want to call Paolozzi's newest Laokoan lurched forward into a funky mashup of man and machine, as well as animal and machine. In his first one-man exhibition at London's Hanover Gallery in 1958, Paolozzi showed a rough and ready cast of characters that were soon stamped new images of man, uh, dreadful existential post-war figures, Giacometti's of the junk pile. Sure, the pathos ridden reading is probably true, but when, sent, but when seen next to the Laokuan, things look a little different. Where the Laokuan is a storm of bodies, of different things whirled together, Paolozzi's creatures are bodies that have incorporated multitudes into themselves. In a lecture delivered at London's Institute of Contemporary Arts in 1958 and published in the first issue of the journal Uppercase soon after, Palazzi claimed his work contained impressions of, quote, dismembered lock, toy frog, rubber dragon, toy camera, assorted wheels and electrical parts, 
clock part, broken comb, old RAF bomb site, and RAF um, standing for Royal Air Force, end quote. And yet, despite this kind of multitude of things, um, what is striking, I think, about these figures um, is the quality of singularity or relative unity that each of these solitary figures possess. They are all alone, no groups here. Rather, they are themselves groups, filled with bits, hatched together into some found object collage, subjected to the lost wax method, and turn out in bronze, avatars of confusion. Um, and here's an image of Paolozzi um, standing next to um, the sculpture Japanese war god. And I think it's interesting how he's kind of taking the measure of himself um, in relation to these figures. So there's Jason, uh, which we saw just a second ago, slumped back, little rotator cap on his crotch, and Chinese dog, and here, Japanese war god. I read these sculptures as accidents, the car plowing into the Laokuan as a freak occurrence. War arrives, it's everywhere in Palazzi's scrapbooks, and the car hits the rails, and this is the aftermath. And I think it's also worth noting um, how real this kind of experience of war was for Palazzi. And I just want to remind us or um, mention that his own father was killed in July 1940 um, when, as an Italian national, um, he was expelled from the United Kingdom, sent back to Italy, and his boat was um, torpedoed. Um, which is to say, I think that accidents aren't planned, they happen, and afterwards, one is forced to pick up the pieces. As the 50s turned into the 60s, however, Paolazzi started to rethink this hybridization, this entanglement of life and technology. He started to think of it more as a crash, which I want to suggest implies a certain intentionality. And here I'm showing you a sculpture kind of from after that shift um, console from 1962, crafted out of gunmetal. Um, and almost here we have this idea that the human body has become a kind of control tower. J.G. Ballard, the English writer and keen observer of contemporary art, um, opens his novel Crash from 1973 by marking this distinction between accident and crash. And this is the first sentence. He writes, Vaughn died yesterday in his last car crash. During our friendship, he had rehearsed his death in many crashes, but this was his only true accident. A crash is only a collision, in other words, two things smashing together. It can be planned, choreographed, and coordinated, but an accident is literally out of one's control. The accident is the topoi, I want to argue, of Paolozzi's first works. That's how he understood the body's relationship to technology, as this tangled mass of post-war scrap. But as he moved forward in time, and as, indeed as time moved forward, he began to see this combination as designed, polished, the image of the crash. This marks a paradigm shift in Paolozzi's art and how the relationship between the body and technology is conceived. So on that note, I want to return to Paolozzi's Laokuan once again in closing. It's a figure that can be conjugated in any number of ways, in both past and future tenses as both accident and crash. But what is perhaps most important is that it holds the door open for other traditions of sculpture, not simply the progressive high modernist truth to materials one, but the slightly tacky B-grade postmodern version of post-war sculpture, wrestling against taste to try and say something about bodies and their prostheses by drawing on and running into the traditions of the past. Indeed, I think we will see many more laukons of this nature over the course of this symposium and in the exhibition 
that Patricia and Francisca are currently putting together. And I look forward to hearing more about that. So thank you so much. Alex, um, thanks a lot for this presentation. And that was really exciting to see. And already I think there are a few things coming up between um, the presentation by Anne on David Smith's welded work and I think the Paolozzi works in particular of the 1950s. I'm looking forward to discuss that with both of you. And it's now my pleasure um, to welcome Namiko Kunimoto. She's our third speaker tonight. Um, Namiko Kunimoto is Associate Professor in the History of Art Department at Ohio State University. And she's also the Director of the Center for Ethnic Studies at the same university. Namiko is a specialist in modern and contemporary Japanese art with research interests in gender, race, urbanization, transnationalism, and nation formation. Her recent essays include Olympic Descent, Art, Politics, and the Tokyo Games in Asia Pacific, Japan, Focus 2018, and Tactics and Strategies, Chen Quin Lin and the Production of Space in Art Journal 2019. Namiko was awarded a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada Fellowship, as well as a Japan Foundation Fellowship in 2007 and 16. She also received a College Art Association Millard Mice Author Award and an OSU Alumni Award for Distinguished Teaching in 2018. She has been a panelist for the National Endowment of the Arts and is an executive member of Japan Arts and Globalization, as well as Vice President of the Japan Art History Forum. Her book, The Stakes of Exposure, Anxious Bodies in Post-War Japanese Art, was published in 2017 by the University of Minnesota Press. In this presentation, Namiko looks at Tanaka Atsuko's work in the context of post-war Japan, and specifically the industrial and economic transformation of Osaka, the second largest city in the country. At the center of her talk is Tanaka's iconic electric dress from 1956, a performance dress consisting of numerous light bulbs of different colors that transformed the artist's body into an electric circuit at the threat of physical peril. I quote from Namiko's abstract. The captivating quality of electric dress was due in no small measure to the marked tension it created between the sphere of the techno spectacle and the vulnerable human body. The adornment of the physical form was a barrage on the senses. The incandescent brightness of electric dress hazing or blinding vision, its mass limiting mobility, its sound impeding hearing, its immensity overwhelming. Tanaka's piece explored subjectivity as a constructed process reliant on visual signifiers, bodily performance, and the fluid context of industrialization, urbanization, and the encroachment of technology into ever more corners of people's everyday lives. Namiko, we look forward to your presentation, Tanaka Atsuko, Circuits of Technology and the Female Labor, and I hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm really excited to be here and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the program. It seems like you've all done a remarkable, remarkable amount of work to get everything together, uh, technologically speaking, which is so fitting, of course. Uh, so I'll begin. Tanaka Atsuko was a 20-year-old artist in Osaka in 1952 when the Allied occupation of Japan came to a close. Within a few short years, the stabilizing changes took place in the artist's hometown. A marked growth in population density due to transportation upgrades, a sudden increase in the commercialization of women's bodies in the media, unprecedented industrial development, and a surge of productivity in the arts. What effects would this unsettled environment have on one's sense of self, and in what relation would that bear on art? Without question, Tanaka's 1956 performance piece, Electric Dress, has become the most celebrated of her works. The captivating quality of the early performance piece was due in no small measure to the tension it created between the sphere of cyborg spectacle and the vulnerable human body. And here we'll note in our program, I'm focusing a bit more on gender. Electric Dress is roughly the height of the average human body and covers the wearer from head to toe. Widely circulated photographs of the piece, few of them that there are, show Tanaka's barely visible but recognizable visage peering out from behind a veil of tubular bulbs. Photographs provide impressions of the mass of the piece, its fullness covering her head and the sides of her face. 
Her legs were completely covered by spiraling wires resembling an overgrown vine. Only her impassive expression and portions of her hands were visible. The work's nearly 200 hand-painted bulbs covered in synthetic resin enamel paints resulted in an exceptionally heavy contraption, especially given the density of the 1950s industrial materials, and some have estimated it to weigh over 50 kilograms. To help offset the weight, Tanaka wore the piece as it was suspended from the ceiling. Electric dress emphasized the ability of industrial force to overwhelm the senses, powered by an electric circuit co-developed by Tanaka and an electrician that she had befriended. The dress flashed sequentially and the velocity of the signals increased until reaching levels that Tanaka called incessant and chaotic. The adornment of the physical form was a barrage on the senses of the wearer, the incandescent brightness of electric dress hazing or blinding vision, its mass limiting mobility, its sound impeding hearing, its heat impairing touch, its immensity overwhelming. So we have to think of the gearbox as it was originally produced in the 1950s was quite loud. Viewers to a lesser extent were also vulnerable to the work's effects. It was a noisy and heat producing contraption that could not go unnoticed. The noise and spectacle of electric dress was closely related to developments in Japan in the 1950s. In 1956, Japan was poised for a period of breakneck technological and industrial development and was practically buzzing with mechanical momentum. Key to the impending series of transformations was the re-establishment of Japan Railways in 1949 by the United States General Headquarters, which set into motion circuitries of motion across the nation at unprecedented speeds. Connections between Tokyo and Osaka were to form the primary transport arteries. More importantly, the trains had actively manufactured that modernity through the rapid transport of objects and bodies. And the trains were a subject of every news article from these times. As Paul Brillio has suggested, the mechanisms of war constructed a direct interest in the speed that has brought about a complete reassessment of human experience. Although intended to heal the great rural-urban divide, the introduction of high-speed transport in fact exacerbated the problem as commuting distance could, could be longer and families increasingly began to live in different regions. The flashing lights and sense of disorder in electric dress are a synecdoche of the hustle and bustle of Osaka vividly evoking the transportation networks that were central to post-war urbanization and economic development. Even in its earliest versions, the haphazardly grouped lights had an unruly effect that negated the decorative aspect of the lights and emphasized the ability of the media to overcome the subject wear. Significantly, Tanaka in her performance pieces covered herself with made-in-Japan exports of cloth and cheap industrial lights, drawing attention to the capitalist evaluative systems that can treat bodies and products equally. Notably, textile and light industry commodity production was often women's work, hence the production was often as gendered as the consumption. Tanaka's artwork emerges from this fragmentation of young women into their body parts and their fantastic recreation which tellingly speaks to the logic of commodity production. It was in this heady atmosphere of speed and dislocation, when vast electrical circuits were laid across Japan, that Tanaka turned to wire her own works. In its emergence in a time of confusion and anxiety, electric dress is like a double-sided skin. On one hand, it shines like the alluring city, spectacularizing the utilitarian lights and Tanaka herself. On the other, it is a luminous shield that keeps the outside at bay. Inviting as the vividness of the dress may be, it refutes touch in its incandescence. The glow and reflection of the lights enact movement, but the weight of it restricts bodily action. Tanaka's art experiment sent the subject within a specifically 1950s technology that was physical and spatial, unlike later artists such as Eva Hesse, who took up similar formal interests in wiry connections. Electric dress thus seems to activate surface as a means to explore subjectivity as a nexus between inside and outside, negotiating how the technologies of post-war Osaka might be tested in the realm of performance art and representation, as well as on the body. Tanaka pursues the limitation of space between personhood and media. She seeks out the upper limits of heat, sound, luminosity, and size that the physical body could bear. She determines the interstices between the body and technology, revealing how our mediatized selves produce the gendered self in their expectations, juxtapositions, and danger.
Although Tanaka was a reluctant participant in direct politics, electric dress seemed uncannily in tune with the politics of consumption debated at the time. In 1955, for example, the Hatoyama election campaign focused on the notion of bright Japan, or akarui niho, the goals of which were to oppose increasing, uh, increasing materialization and westernization. Ironically, and perhaps predictably, it was the electric goods companies that then seized upon this particular concept of the bright life, which seemed ideally suited to produce the products they were selling. The fluorescent light bulb was one of the new products that spread rapidly throughout Japan in the 1950s. It was Matsushita National Brand that adopted the sl slogan, Bright National, which registered well among consumers. Historian Simon Partner has shown how a women's group diary eloquently sums up the desire evoked by the bright life to escape the grim present. Quote, when we look at the lights of the occupation soldiers gleaming on the hilltop and compare them with our own dim lives, we feel we must act to make our lives brighter. For if we don't, who will? End quote. Tanaka's medium relied on the products of Bright National that showed the darker side of industry that leaned so heavily on women's labor. Electrical goods companies competed directly with textile factories for young female labor. Underneath the apparent revolution in technology development and industrial structure lay a profound continuity based on the abundance of extremely cheap, relatively docile female labor. And in fact, there is um, documentation of company owners talking about the nimble fingers of women and how they were more able to do this technological work. Tanaka's art suggests the threat posed by technological advancement wherein the possibility of direct physical contact with the human removed and replaced by the interface of the telephase body and the commercially represented body. Industrial development held the promise of progress and change, but often it revealed the risks of swift transformation. While the new high-speed Tokaido train line resulted in economic growth and access to jobs for a wider demographic, the headlines that celebrated its unremitting increases in velocity soon shifted focus. Alarming reports of young women committing suicide by jumping in front of trains, in, um, sorry, by jumping in front of trains increasingly took precedence in the newspapers, gruesomely literalizing the obliteration of bodies by industrialization. So leading up to this point, all the newspapers were so excited about the increasing speeds of their uh, their uh, trains, they were always advertising these kilometers, and suddenly you see the switch where there's a, a shocking number of suicides taking place. Japan had the highest suicide rate in the industrial world, peaking at a rate of 24 per 100,000 people per year in 1956, precisely the year that electric dress was made. Furthermore, those most likely to commit suicide were tears, women between, 19, uh, between 20 and 24 years old. This was the only historical moment to date when female suicides exceeded that of male suicide. Japanese women were four times as likely to commit suicide than their American counterparts in 1955. And suicide was, and remains, the leading cause of death for women between the ages of 15 and 34. In the 1950s, moreover, the urban center with the highest su suicide rate was none other than Osaka. Tanaka, who had faced her own challenges with mental health and fascination with train stations, may not have been aware of the statistical realities, but could not have missed the heightened levels of mental instability and anxiety felt by her young female peers. These apprehensions were reenacted and explored in electric dress. Showing you her brother trying it on here so you can see it uh, in action as well. A composite machine and body, electric dress suggested an unfamiliar, incomplete subject. I'm going to briefly show you another artist as a comparison. Similarly, conceptual artist and dancer Tsujimura Kazuko often negated the body in her work, revealing instead the dangers of a subject that can be dissembled and replaced. The young artist dance and conceptual art revealed the blurry line between personhood and objecthood, exposing how the gendered figure was co-opted by mechanisms of state capital. Tsujimura fractures the human object binary, instead shows us the ornamental woman as constructed through masks, fabrics, and machines. For example, here we see Tsujimura's contribution to catastrophe art for the World Uprising exhibition in 1972, where she seems to mock the idea of unique personhood and suggests that women are little more than disposable, repetitious amusements. <laughs> 
In the installation piece, her body is obscured by a white dress hanging by a string, reminiscent of puppetry. This effect is magnified by the cutout hand shaped as though holding a string in the background. Other silhouettes of hands further complicate the image, making it hard to discern which hand belongs to which body. Similarly, the silhouette of the head alongside her own suggests the individual body is not so different from a doll. From the view of the labor market, we are constructed. We are replaceable. Notably, the edges of her arm are visible, as if to suggest that this process of replacement is imperfect. The smooth continuity between Tsuchimura's whitened face and the blank whiteness of the silhouette deliberately creates a sense of ambivalence about the real as it pertains to corporeality. Was the silhouette created from one person and then the person constructed themselves after the silhouette, or are they one and the same? Does the white dress shield the body, symbolize or actualize the body? Light contours vaguely visible behind the dress suggest, but do not confirm bodily presence. Like electric dress here, the dress and its wearer hover between object and person. Tujimura reveals how womanness and the object are already intertwined. In the mass ornament, Siegfried Krakauer has discussed the ways that the Tiller Girls, a precision dance chorus popular at the turn of the century and revived again in the 1950s, were distraction factories served to serve the masses of salary workers who lacked spirituality and were divorced from custom and tradition. According to Krakauer, the hands in the factory correspond to the legs of the Tiller Girls. Tsujimura too seems to recognize dance as mass ornament, a staged rationalization of the body that feeds into the machines of capital and grew from the alluring images of unified military bodies, such as in Imperial Japan. The dance troupe produced women as ornaments, composed of thousands of bodies, sexless bodies in bathing suits. For Krakauer, the Tiller Girls are unified and objectified to the point that eroticism is removed and the bodies can only be understood rationally as a series of arms, thighs, and other segments. This kind of dedication of the physical and emotional self for mass distraction is what many artists and dancers, including Tanaka and Tsujimura, sought to expose or reject. And of course, uh, this kind of dance uh, was huge in 1950s, both in cabaret um, and other later forms of uh, ballet. Viewing the most frequently published photograph of the performance of electric dress, one can sense Tanaka's tenuous mastery of the production. She occupied a central yet unstable position. The work was at once a peculiar visionary spectacle, yet somehow restrained in movement and difficult to see. It would have been eye-catching and blinding, drawing the viewer to try and focus on the artist's subject. Like a whisper, the low-level perceptibility of the subject wear marks his or her hidden import. In the act of looking, the viewer too is complicit in the performative construction. Tanaka, in the making and wearing of her electric clothes, risks the body's security through exposure to heat and electric wiring in the performance, while at the same time illumining her own role as artist. And like Alex, I'll refer to McLuhan here. In understanding media, McLuhan sees art as something that helps us prepare for the coming changes in the outside world, an idea whose relevance in performance art has been further articulated by our guest, Anne Wagner. In her article, Performance Video and the Rhetoric of Prevence, Presence, Anne has argued that video art, particularly in its formative stage, sought to examine and expose how, quote, art's summoning of selfhood is compromised by what we might call a media effect. Wagner sees earlier video art not as electronic narcissism, but as a politicized engagement with media that reveals that video, as McLuhan argues, is the medium that shapes and controls the scale and form of human association and action. Vito Aconci, Joan Jonas, and Peter Campus are mentioned as artists, among others, who know about narcosis and numbing, know how to induce them, and know that the reality of the body and its senses, the reality of personhood, are somehow at stake. Tanaka, too, was absorbed in the potentially destructive aspects of urbanization in modern Japan. She described the first time she wore electric dress in 55. When I was finished, I was uncomfortable with the electrical connections, since somebody had to wear it. I covered myself with vinyl and put the electric dress on. The moment Mr. San Nomio said, I'm turning the electricity on, I had the fleeting thought, is this how a death row inmate would feel? In conclusion, Tanaka's comment compellingly suggests that the central thesis of this presentation, that electric dress evokes the overwhelming of aspects of technology so ubiquitous, particularly in post-war Osaka, constructed to the visual interface of surface, and in doing so, the work explores the interstices and limits of gender subjectivity. 
The double-edged nature of this performance piece is evident in the riotous color and spectacular language of the dress versus the explicit threat in its weight and heat, and the channel channeling of a current that was deadly when misused. While the early performance piece occupies a critical position in Tanaka's work, it has consequences beyond the scope of her personal artistic maturation. Her piece is revealing of self-exposure and self-destruction, issues that loomed large in 1950s Japan. Electric dress displays gender subjectivity as unstable and uncertain rather than declaratively individualistic. It suggests how developing one's sense of self in post-war Japan was a process that was powerful and yet rife with risks, revealing subjectivity as vulnerable to the effects of surface contact, reliant on bodily performance, and exposed to industrialization, urbanization, and manufactured commercial desires. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I'm muted. Here I am. Thanks a lot, Namiko, um, for this wonderful presentation. And I was just reflecting that with um, Paolozzi and with David Smith, I think we have a lot to talk about uh, the question, how dehumanizing effects of technology come into play. And um, yeah, so I would like to start um, a conversation between the three of you. And thank you again for your fantastic um, contributions. We'll talk um, around 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes between the four of us, and then we would ask our fellow symposium um, contributors to join the discussion if they want and taking questions um, from the chat. Um, with your presentations in mind, I think I'd like to go back to a basic aspect of each of these artists' practices, and that is the materials. Um, and I'd start with Smith and Paolozzi first, because in both artists, we find a long list of materials they've been using in their respective practices. Paolozzi listing, among others, toy cameras, electric cards, radio, etc. cetera. Um, in Smith's case, stocks of bold, nuts, tape, square machine parts, etc. And it seems that to both artists, it was relevant um, that the materials be recognized in the works they were doing. And I think there's something very interesting at play um, in this relationship. Um, and going back to your presentation, uh, and you started to talk about um, the relational system of the grid. You talked about the individual components that David Smith was using, how the floor actually allowed him to construct his sculptural work and to translate it from the flatness and the surface aspect of his work into the three-dimensionality. Um, in my eye and the way you've crafted your paper, um, one could, of course, describe these various material components that um, David Smith has used as the artist's elementary sculptural language, basically as the words from which he would compose his syntax that then would expand to the grid that you've started to map out in your presentation. And even if we agree that the sculpture is not always meant to be read or to fully understood, I'd like to speculate on the notion of languages a little because that was something that you'd been bringing up in the conversations we had when we started talking about David Smith in this context. With the selection of materials in mind, um, and maybe it's good to think of Agricola Head um, in this context, but we could also evoke um, artworks like the Agricola series, but also the Tang Totems, for instance. I would like to ask what the audience for these materials is in David Smith. Um, you've shown him as a worker um, and as a working class person or someone that associated himself with manual labor with the working class. And I wanted to ask um, you, Anne, if you think that the works were intended to be legible to a specific group of people in terms of the language they were speaking materially. <clears throat> who's, who's going to re reply first? Anne, please. You. I'd like to hear about David Smith in this case. Um, well, thank you for the um, questions. And also, thanks to my fellow speakers for their presentations, which I so loved hearing and which I thought were terrifically presented. And um, 
to answer your questions, uh, starting with the, I mean, David Smith was such a dreamer and in everything he did almost, I mean, he was uh, so passionately focused and also, um, I won't say he was problematically socialized, but I will say that he had, you know, enormous ambitions. And one of the th one of the beautiful thoughts that he had towards the later part of his life was the he started using um, locomotive wheels, and he started to think about sculpture that would sort of travel by rail and could be moved about. And those have a kind of idealism and a um, in a dreamer's populism, which you know I find very um, effective. In terms of audience, though, I mean Greenberg. At, I mean, sorry, Smith. At the same time, was very much if he the friends he had uh, were friends in. Um, in New York, and they were all avant-gardists, of, if the old term still fits. He knew Greenberg, um, he knew Frankenthaler, he knew the abstract expressionists that were, and, you know, outlived some of them by a bit. But um, this is enough to suggest that the context in which he traveled at the time was you know, very much New York, although he also showed in London. I'm, I'm not aware of a show that he had in Germany, at the, um, but he certainly um, exhibited in New York and uh, in London in a, quite an active way, uh, at the Tate in particular. Um, I mean, he's a strange sort of uh, conjunction of... of desires, but I think that that sort of, he, he had, you know, the dream was that artworks could travel by train around the country and be seen by everyone, um, which only makes yeah. me think of the way that uh, in the 1960s, Bobby Kennedy's body traveled by train from uh, LA to the East Coast. Anyway, I think, does that begin to answer your question? Yes, um, I think that the, um, this kind of idealism that you're speaking to is very interesting. And I wanted to ask you, um, how important do you think it was, in fact, that um, Smith would offer um, a kind of recognition through the materials he would be using? If we're thinking about the agricultural um, tools that he had enclosed or uh, worked into his own sculptural work. Was that something that was important to him in terms that he would really recognize that and would be able to identify on a direct level through the materials he would be seeing? Yeah, I mean, the Agricola series, which you mentioned, um, is really important for that because uh, although the, you know, the first one that I, of the series, which I showed you, is much more subtle in that it's kind of more like, you know, what it refers to really is sort of drain pipes, if anything, but, you know, very, very of a color, which speaks to its earthiness. But the the later um, pieces, for example, the, the beautiful piece at the Tate, um, and many others really, they really do incorporate bits and pieces of the industrialized world. And you can see um, f sort of foot pedals that might be used to push down on, um, you know, to, to run a tool, that sort of thing. And you can, and also, uh, um, you know, various parts that are sort of measurements for, for tools. Uh, so, you know, he, he was very interested in um, work, in labor, um, he, I don't know if you know this amazing piece that he did called Home of the Welder, which was an early piece from the 40s and uh, is almost like a little votive sort of Egyptian sort of votive room, which is furnished as if it were the dream space of a welder, which is... We only know one 
welder in this story, and that welder is Smith. And it's a, a very odd and um, surrealist sort of conjuration of a, th uh, of a sort of model of space with three rooms in which there's pictures and flowers and with vines coming out of them. Um, quite, you know, I mean, he, he, he was a man of great uh, romance and also um, of considerable imagination. And one of the interesting things is that he was able to, or that he ended up translating or um, some transposing that imagination into geometrical terms. Thank you. Um, I'm asking our technicians whether we could have a picture of one of the cubi from Anne's presentation at the end of her presentation, because that's, I think it's really interesting to look at his 1960s works um, in relation to what you have just described, because that's the moment when um, steel, perfect, thank you, we can have Becca um, yeah, or the cubi. No, if you go further, sorry guys, if you go to Q by go um, further ahead. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um if we look at this, I think that's an interesting moment. Um thanks, Wolfie. Um that's an interesting moment um because that is the moment when we see steel in its industrial fabrication, which you've mentioned before, it comes in flat um, sheets of steel, so to say. But that for me is interesting in the sense that this is a material that becomes much more non-descript. You know, it doesn't have a clear functionality. It doesn't come with a specific use um, to David Smith. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that shift um, in his practice on the material level and what that represents in your eyes. I'm sorry, our connection is still a little bit fuzzy. So could you just quickly say again the... the sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk about the this shift in materials that um, Smith has been using. Of course, it's always been steel and iron, but in this case, he starts using the pre prefabricated, the non-descript version of steel, no? It's roll flat and... Um, I'm wondering um, what that really meant the moment that he left the the inscription of the use of the material. You know, he's no longer using items yeah. that are recognizable. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, I mean, uh, my view is that the that steel as a component begins to sort of transcend itself. It do, it's the forms that it takes, the actual uh, three-dimensional form that it takes is three-dimensional. And you can very much, th this is, uh, as you will have intuited, this is the same piece from two views, as my label actually tells you. And you will see that those two views sort of reaffirm each other. Um, it travels through space in a way which is intelligible because the clarity of the steel and the composition of the geometrical box is so beautifully clear. But what he seems to be able to get from steel, um, which he wasn't quite able to get from the painted works that precede them, is the idea of a geometrical clarity, which indeed can have a surface which is not geometric at all. In fact, it's machined so that it has a kind of writing on it. It has, but the writing is a scribble. It's a kind of anti-language. So the clarity of the geometry is undone by the scribble or, or come by the scribble. And then if the light is right, then light will hit this scribble. Do you think you could give us the last or the next slide by any chance? So the light hits it and then the sense of a geometrical clarity is being undermined by the uh, action of the sun in real time, real space. The temporality of the world around it 
controls um, what it is that the work seems to be. So here, for example, we are on the, you know, on the rooftop of the Met. Nowadays, since the Smith estate has gone with Hausner and Worth, you can't get near these things to even, you can, this is so protected as an image. But you're, you can definitely see how at every moment when the New York sun, which is so brilliant, is past this thing, it can be intense enough to blind you. It can be as sullen as, uh, you know, a particularly um, polluted day. Uh, and that is a kind of anti-writing that he inscribes on the surface of his work. Thank you for asking me this, as well as for inviting me, because I get to say the last thoughts, and I also get to say that unlike my brilliant and totally well-mannered fellow participants, I don't think I said thank you for inviting me, which I'm ashamed about. You shouldn't be. It's an honor to have you, Anne. And um, thank you also for talking it's about really the um, the flickering surfaces and also the way you elaborated. I think that is a tension that's at play in Smith's work that you on the one hand have like this industrial fabrication and then this way of interfering and inscribing into the material. So it's really, it feels like a push and pull um, in these directions. I would now um, would like to ask Namiko about the materials that um, Tanaka Atsuko has used. In her case, I think it's pretty unambiguous that her light bulbs um, pick up the register of popular culture. And maybe to start with, um, Namiko, could you tell us a little bit about the, the pattern or the flickering um, of this dress, which we now did, of course, not see in the images, but we can see if we just Google um, for videos of the piece installed. You're muted. Um. Could we please uh, go back to the slide of electric dress? Um, while, while we're finding it, I'll just say about the materiality. It's it's um, it's interesting because, of course, um, she was part of the Gutai Art Association, who uh, far long after uh, Japan was aware of their fame, they uh, became more and more famous here uh, for reasons I think that are problematic in relation to sort of creating an even post-war narrative of, of global uh, global art history, but um, Tanaka became quite famous uh, later on as well. Um, and so there are many reconstructions of electric dress that have been made, um, but the reconstructions, it should be noted, are made out of a different kind of material. And so the light bulbs were uh, lighter uh, material, and also the reconstructions are much smaller. Um, and I think this is a little bit unfortunate. I have seen, um, I think in Musée Pompidou or somewhere, I've seen some gallery goers commenting that uh, Japanese people were a lot smaller then or, um, you know, sort of making uh, incorrect assumptions uh, about electric dress because I think the, the reconstructions really don't show the way it would have uh, looked or felt. Um, also, the original industrial material gave off a lot of heat that you could really feel um, in a room and uh, that's that's not quite the same, I think, in the, the reconstructions. Although generally, I, I saw it at the Gray Gallery at UBC, and they did. It was quite hot um, there as well. Um, but it's speaking about the velocity, uh, yeah. So the original one would flicker on and off, um, and then get increasingly uh, brighter and brighter. Um, she did have other works that sort of played with this kind of um, increasing um, sort of assault on these senses. She had another work called Bell that used sound. And then, um, you know, when you walked into the room, it would ask a gallery goer to press the button and it would make these increasingly loud, shrill noises, um, both forward and backward, um, alarming, you know, 1950s Japanese gallery goers, but they were also this kind of assault on the senses. Thank you, Namiko. Um, I think Something that struck me when I um, saw the electric dress and what, of course, the electric circuit um, kind of asks for is um, to think of Tanaka's work in relation to sender-receiver models. 
and send a receiver mm-hmm. transistor technology of the time um, with all the potential interruptions and distortions that we might have through channels, media, or noise. Um, and also, I'm thinking that the rhythm, the pattern of the flickering really wants to be read. You really want to make sense of it when you look at the work. And so I'm wondering um, if we stay in the speculative realm of like um, the artworks as language, I'm wondering um, whom you think that the electric dress would talk to and whether, and that's something that relates to the latter part of your talk, whether you think that the recipient of this message is still human or whether she addresses more kind of like the dehumanized technological system at the time. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think there's a little bit of um, of a difference between, for example, Tanaka's work, which I discussed, and then Tsujimura's, which is later in the 70s, where I think Tsujimura has sort of become more accepting of uh, the person object and is more interested in revealing to everyone that we are already the person object. Whereas I think Tanaka's, um, you know, you can you can see in the slide here the way the the wire hangs down. It seems so similar to um, you know being hung, and she talks about being a, an, an executioner. Um, and um, of course, there's this link to this this tremendous number of young women uh, committing suicide precisely the year that 1956 was made. Um, so it seems, you know, one might consider it to be like a distress call um, in a way uh, where all of these these women were literally throwing themselves in front of trains. But at the same time, she herself writes about how attractive and alluring Osaka Station had become and how she loved to look at the pharmaceutical neon lights and she wanted to go there and see them. But um, interestingly, I think at the same time, uh, ending with David Smith, she actually recedes entirely in 1965 and leaves the Gutai group um, due to mental health issues and moves to a very quiet Nara uh, temple where she lives basically in a Buddhist temple, a fairly reclusive life where Kanayama Akira, another member of the Gutai, looks after her. So you could say she was sort of, I don't know who she might be speaking to, but I think there is sort of an urgency. Um, and this really goes against much of the scholarship, I think, that there is on Gutai, which talks about Gutai being playful, whimsical, um, embracing a celebration of democracy. And I, I really don't read it that way at all. I see it about being unstable and, and fearful, even excited, but still alarming. Um, but I do think there were also personal dialogues. So, for example, in one of her early works, um, which was called Stage Clothes. She had lights that flashed on and off, and they actually went in time with Kanayama Akira's um, traffic light, which I think there is a slide of. Can you see that, Wolfie, the slide of uh, Kanayama Akira next to a, a train light? Um, not sure if you can see it there. It's just at the end. Um, so Kanayama uh, was the one who originally invited here, uh, originally invited her to be in Gutai, and then they sort of created this work that uh, visually spoke to each other at one of their first outdoor exhibitions. Um, uh, of course, Kanayama was a conceptual artist as well, uh, but then as uh, Tanaka became increasingly unwell, he, he took to looking after her and helping her build her artistic career. Um, but you know, there is a literal answer in some ways. She was speaking to Kanayama as well. Thanks a lot. Um, mm-hmm. I'd like to go to um, Paolozzi um, because I think, I, Alex, you've been talking about this question of whether the artist is a receiver or a sender in the relation to Paolozzi's curatorial work. So in an essay that you've written on Parallel of Art and Life, you wrote that um, Paolozzi fashioned himself as a receiver, as an artist whose practice is influenced by a variety of sources that he would display in the exhibition together with Nigel Henderson. And I'm wondering whether you could um, relate that back to the sculptures of Paolozzi um, of the 1950s mm-hmm. and describe this relation between technology and the body in his work. And I'm also very interested in this question of the integrity or the autonomy of the body which is both the human body, but also the sculptural body in um, Paolozzi's work, as you've been mm-hmm. talking about the question of unity, but the disparate elements that come together in it. Mm-hmm. Um, thanks for making that wonderful connection for me. Uh, can you hear me? Good. Um, I think the idea of receiver 
the artist as receiver, but also the sculpture as receiver um, is really important here. And um, Patrizia is referring to an exhibition I don't have an image of, unfortunately, but a parallel of life and art, which um, Paolozzi staged in 1953 at the Institute of Contemporary Arts with Nigel Henderson, a photographer, um, and the architects, Allison Smithson and Peter Smithson. And it was this kind of image environment of you know, disparate, different kinds of images kind of surrounding um, the space. And I think I actually got, got that idea of the receiver um, from looking at a photograph that Nigel Henderson had taken of his daughter kind of in the middle of the space. And she almost kind of appeared as an image too and was kind of surrounded by them. Um, but I think this idea of the artist is somehow kind of passive, perhaps isn't quite the right word, but subjected, uh, internalizing, taking on um, images is, is quite important. And I think maybe one thing that gets lost in the images of some of the sculptures by Palazzi I showed, such as Jason, maybe we can put that one up, um, is this kind of quality of collage, the collage method that Palazzi is using. Um, and I think actually perhaps today Palazzi is most well known for his collage work that he was making at the time, uh, works on paper, um, as opposed to the sculptures. Um, and, and of course, you, you lose it in the detail a little bit of these works, but he's taking these objects that he itemizes and then impressing them in wax. And then from wax, um, making uh, bronzes out of them. So there's many levels of kind of transformation. Though I think the identity of um, the objects comes through. And I, I was just thinking about the title of uh, Jason today in particular. Um, I th it's a classical reference to Jason and the Argonauts. Um, and of course, the Argonauts is the kind of the famous ship that, while at sea, manages, they rebuild the ship while they're at sea so that the ship that they arrive in at the end is the same in name, but is actually made out of completely different parts. Um, and to me, that, that's starting to seem like a kind of fantastic allegory for these sculptures. Um, in the reflections on the human, you know, in some way we still call it human, perhaps. So I think the kind of man, animal, uh, human animal connection in Palazzi is worth teasing out as well. But perhaps this figure, we should call it, um, you know, is going to be made out of something entirely different than um, it was before the war. And that it was before a certain kind of confrontation um, between the body and technology that takes place after the war. So I think that they're precarious, they're, they're fearful um, somehow, but the, they're also kind of um, necessary and um, carrying on perhaps. Thanks a lot. Um, I have, of course, a whole array of more questions, but nonetheless, I know that there are people um, waiting behind the scenes who might want to ask questions. So I want to have a quick look at our Zoom um, and see our fellow guests that have been with us behind the scenes and um, would like to ask whether anyone would have a question here. So maybe we can see that. Um, Just a second. And maybe in the meantime, I can take um, one question that came directed at Anne Wagner. And um, there was a question whether you would be willing to tell a little more about the concept of the sculpture as grid in post-war sculptures so or someone who's been picking up on um, the end of your presentation and the display of the sculptures in a grid. Um, in Bolton Landing by David Smith. Hmm. An interesting question. Uh, I wish that I could say that I could provide a larger context for that for to whoever asked. Um, 
but of course, Smith was a sort of an unusual uh, individual in that he had this farm that he bought for a song. It used to be a fox farm when he and his first wife purchased it. Um, and he had this uh, world outdoors in which he could grid his work. He didn't have it. He didn't have those conditions in any other space that I know of. So that, um, and it's certainly not the case that I have. I myself have seen an exhibition that has ever adhered to this notion. Although some of the people who are listening may know such a thing and may uh, reference it to me and vice versa. One of the things which I, did, I didn't know before I prepared this paper that the concrete sites uh, bases were permanent and so that therefore he, you know, he was completely uh, devoted to that way of arranging things. But I'm, that's as far as, I mean, the grid is always, a, you know, a tool of relation. Uh, and spatial uh, location, and so therefore, this this is something clearly that he is uh, working with and well aware of. Thank you very much. And there's one comment that might be of interest to you, Anne, um, that Frank O'Hara's mm -hmm. David Smith retrospective was actually shown in Nuremberg and Duisburg in Germany in '66 and '67. So after. Um, I know. I later, I, ha I do yeah. have. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I yeah, do that have that catalog on my desk, uh, but I I take that point. Yeah, brilliant. Then I have a look. Oh, hi! I see a number of our guests. Um, I have a question from Megan Luke. Megan. Uh, thank you. I hope I'm audible. Um, thank you, three of you, for these. Um, fascinating talks and which I thought all integrated beautifully in the sense that we're being asked to consider the body of sculpture as somehow encoded in quite different ways across all three papers. And um, just following on this last comment, um, I was very intrigued, Alex, this is a question for you. It was just a passing remark that you made in your talk about how the Laokawan as a sculpture can be as you put it, conjugated in any number of ways. And I was mm -hmm. wondering if I could just um, hear you expand upon that a little bit more, um, because I was quite intrigued by this two-page spread in the Paolozzi, the way in which mm -hmm. the Laokawan figures as a photographic reproduction on one page with a diagrammic, diagrammatic rendering of the automobile. On the facing page, you have this printed, almost diagrammatic, uh, Mm -hmm. contour etching or engraving of the Laokawan with the photographic representation of the automobile. And I was, w I would love to hear you reflect a little bit further about on conjugation and its ties to different technologies of uh, reproducibility for the sculpture mm -hmm. more specifically, if that's, if that's how you're even thinking about it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Can, am I being heard? Wonderful. Great. Nice to see so many nodding heads. Um, and I, I should point out again that there's yet another version in the history of nothing film. So uh, again, there's this kind of logic of return um, in in Paolozzi. I think um, that's why I didn't want to call them drawings or collages, but rather images, which is a word very kind of native to him um, that he kind of meditates on um, and returns to and does these different takes on. Um, I, I guess when I I use the word conjugating um, to think of, you know, in the sense of tenses. Um, in it, though the this image is published in '63, appears a year earlier in '62. We don't really know when he made it, and dating and Paolozzi is a kind of strange thing. But I like to think that he has these images that he holds on to and kind of returns to, um, and kind of imagines them in different ways. So I, when I, I was talking about conjugating, I was trying to fit it with this kind of rubric of the accident and the crash that I was trying to map out. The accident maybe evoking this kind of immediate post-war um, 
meeting of the body and technology, this kind of uh, out of control, and that the crash somehow is um, this kind of intentional and certainly in Ballard's resonance, um, almost kind of erotic combination of um, the body and technology that then it seems to me Palazzi, you know, rethinks that uh, those terms in these sculptures that he starts to make in 62, 63, which are these kind of highly polished, organized, designed, um, you know, totems that, that seem to have in quality and facture, you know, almost no resemblance to what he was making before. So I, I think of them both as kind of, again, Laokuans, but he's conjugating in different ways and, and that he has these kind of terms in mind um, that he's able to return to and revise in different historical moments. If, I, I don't know if I'm kind of addressing some of your questions, but I think that's how, how I was thinking of it. Thanks. Yeah. I see Megan nod, actually. Um, I saw someone else raise a hand. Um, ah, Francisca, my dear colleague. So you'll finally see her on screen. Francisca, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much for your three inspiring contributions and discussion. And I have a question, a question that I would like to direct to Namiko. So electric dress was planned as a performance piece and now the substitute, so to speak, has remained as a sculpture and for reasons of conservation can now only be exhibited but no longer performed or activated. So could you perhaps say something more about the ambivalent role of sculpture in these contexts and to what degree Tanaka has handled this? Um, right. I don't think Tanaka really said too much um, about it. She she didn't make a lot of comments on these kinds of things, but there is um, some literature uh, talking about the ways that uh, most of the Gutai group and perhaps Tanaka um, especially was interested in painting and that electric dress in some ways refers back to painting. Um, she did insist that it be displayed uh, in front of the series of paintings that she made which were uh, both leading up to electric dress and then following electric dress. So there is this um, actual sort of conversation between electric dress as a piece and painting. Um, but as I said, I think one of the sort of downfalls of the recreation is just that it's made of different material. And so it, it's read very differently. Um, and um, it's, it's challenging to kind of imagine how it might have come across when she was wearing it. Um, and there were actu actually one occasion where another Gutai member, Shiraga Kazuo, wore it and performed as well, and she did a, a different performance. Um, so, um, yeah, I think at least with the, the visitors I've encountered, as I've said, don't really, you know, some have remarked that it looks like a Christmas tree, which is obviously not the most culturally appropriate thing to reference it to, but I don't think the sort of power of it comes across in the same way. Um, but I think that can be generated uh, with enough um, contextual information um, and perhaps other, you know, visuals and, and footage and photography. Thank you very much. And I would follow up um, with a question that reached us through the chat that goes also to you, Namiko. Um, it's more of a comment. Um, there's a great link between the comment about crash and accidents, uh, so Alex's talk, and the question of agency, and what Namiko described mm -hmm. with the Osaka train suicides and industrial industrialization crashing into the body quite literally. Um, I wonder what the artists discussed imply about this notion of agency and technological determinism. And maybe that's a question that I would first give to you, Namiko, and then to Alex. Um, so what, how the artist responded to technological agency in terms of artist statements or things like that? Um, well, yeah. you know, that's an interesting question. One, one I think there's, um, it should be known that the Gutai Art Association is, is always characterized as a very international group, um, uh, you know, well aware of developments across the world. And that certainly was the case of the leader Yoshihara Jiro. Um, who, uh, you know, was very well read uh, and was fairly well off and got all kinds of art journals. Uh, Tanaka, on the other hand, was the youngest daughter of uh, 
a matchmaking, I mean, matches that, you know, would light Sidorex. Uh, so she was a very working class, the ninth daughter, very large family being supported during difficult war times. And she uh, did not have any university education at all. Um, and so she wasn't really engaged um, textually with these kinds of art historical dialogues. And much of what she learned would have come through she had a judo. Um, so she didn't really make any of those kinds of statements about it um, in that respect. Um, but I think clearly she was in touch with, quite literally, um, the feelings and the emotions of being in Osaka at that time. Um, I didn't have a chance to explain how personal space actually was reduced uh, by more than um, 30%, I think. So literally the amount of space that you would have around you uh, within the space of a year was drastically reduced. So you would actually feel that kind of immobility uh, that you can witness when she's wearing electric dress. Um, so I think that's, you know, kind of woven into how she made her material and expressed it that way, but she didn't address it specifically with text. Thank you. And Alex, do you know about um, Paolozzi? And I think really the question of technological determinism is quite interesting in his work. Um, I, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. Um, yeah. It's um, it's the relation of these images of collisions of bodies and technology that we've seen in the different iterations, and specifically also in your in your talk and the questions whether the artists discussed the implications of such um, notions of agency versus technological determinism. That's something I've been asking you in a way about the question of autonomy mm. or integrity um, of the body um, in relation to like the technological impact it experiences. I guess the question is, is about, is it the agency of the artist or is it kind of the imagined agency of the types of figures that the artist is presenting, right? I mean, um, yes. I, I guess, you know, when I talk about the idea of sculpture as a receiving device, it, it would kind of suggest that these figures are, are not with, great agency, right? That they're being determined from the outside, that they're be, being determined by um, historical, technological um, forces. But of course, it's not monolithic, right? That of course, we have um, different combinations of, or, or different people are in different positions of power. Um, I, I think the connection with uh, Namiko's paper is quite fascinating and the suicides which are obviously a kind of form of dark agency um, are certainly kinds of crashes as I was um, describing them and the desire to kind of um, end one's life in that way seems quite a agential a and kind of significant um, decision so I, I guess um, you know, we're, we're going to see different examples of agency um, depending on where we look. And maybe there, there's a shift um, in this move I'm trying to map out from kind of accident to, to crash. That there, there's an idea of agency in the crash um, that certainly there, there's not in the accident. Thank you. Yeah, I see Namiko was raising her hand and... Yeah, I'll just add on, you know, that it is this crazy... Um, is my mic on? Yeah, there is this yes. very bizarre way that um, the trains, um, for any of you who have been in Japan, are extremely um, planned, so you can take the 803 and it will leave at exactly 803. Uh, they're very timely um, and systemic. Um, so in some ways, it is this kind of dark agency, as Alex says, to actually use your life to stop that uh, technological system, because that is, um, in my experience living in Japan, usually the only reason that a train might be delayed. Um, so it, it does actually use the body to interrupt the technology in a way that one might um, sort of describe as agency. And then I'll just add, um, in terms of Palozzi, I think there's such fascinating um, crossovers between the artist Nakamura Hiroshi, who also worked on um, trains 
and the body mm-hmm. and these really, you know, sometimes erotic uh, machinist ways that um, I think are rather fascinating. But I'll leave some time for Anne. Thank you. I mean, we're already um, over time and I'm getting the signals now to um, basically um, look at uh, the clock. Um, it's five past nine already. These two hours have passed incredibly quickly and I'm very grateful to all of you um, for having been with us and for your precious contributions. And I'm very sorry that we can't continue this conversation for another two hours. I'm sure we would have enough to talk about. But we have um, two days of conversations coming up. I hope all of you will be joining us again, both um, our audience online as well as our speakers of the symposium. I warmly thank um, Anne Wagner, Alex Kitnick and Namiko Kunimoto for your fabulous contributions. And I would like to invite everyone back um, tomorrow at 5 p.m. We have our next panel coming up um, and maybe we can see the last slide exactly titled Hybrid Figurations of the 1960s. And I think it will follow up in many interesting ways on the conversation we've started today with her contributions by Joe Applin, Antje Krausewahl and Marta Jewanska chaired by Manuela Amma. So I hope to see you back again and thanks again to everyone um, for tonight. <laughs>